Among the most beautiful art forms from Africa are hand-woven textiles. Both men and women in Africa continue to weave textiles that are in great demand on the international art market and that are used by African people on important occasions. Male and female weavers in Africa use very different equipment and produce different textiles using very different techniques. This video is intended to demonstrate the techniques used by African men who weave on narrow warp, double heddle horizontal looms and by women who weave on broad warp, single heddle vertical looms. The video includes images of Mosi, Marka, Asante, Eve, and Cape Verde men weaving on narrow looms, and of Igbo women from the city of Akwete weaving on broad looms. Africans continue to this day to weave elaborate and very beautiful textiles, and they produce these textiles using very simple tools and materials. Although textile factories have been built in almost every country on the continent, there continues to be a demand for traditional hand-woven textiles that reflects a rich cultural creativity and a proud cultural history. The first step in the process is to transform the raw cotton into thread or yarn that can be woven. While this is most frequently done by machine, there are many women in Africa who spin cotton by hand. This woman is using a drop spindle, one of the most ancient tools in human history. After the thread has been spun, it is either woven into plain white cloth or it is taken to a dyer who dyes it blue with indigo leaves. This art form has disappeared in many parts of Africa as traditional dyes and dyers have been replaced by factory spun and dyed yarn. When I visited the village of Buse in 1976 and 1977, there were over a hundred dyers working every day at dozens of deep dye pits. When I returned in 2002, there was only one elderly man producing the deep blue indigo dyed cloth that was once worn by all Mosi men and women. The dyer soaks the cloth in a dark blue dye made of indigo leaves and a chemical binder or mordant made of ashes of the net material removed from the bottom of the dye pit. The cloth must be dyed a dozen times before it is the dark blue black that is required. The dye itself is actually green until it oxidizes and turns blue after exposure to the air. Et c'est chauffé ici. Oui. Et puis ici, il y a le tissu dans la dans la tin. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Et ce sont les tins qu'on achète au marché ou ce sont des tins qu'on fait avec les feuilles? 
Elsewhere in Africa, as here in Dakar, Senegal, dyers use commercial dyes. The dyed thread is then given to a weaver, such as this Marka man working in the city of Bobo Jalasa. The simplest weave is a pattern of warp stripes in which alternating threads of natural white and blue dyed thread are arranged in long warps that produce a simple blue and white striped cloth. Several narrow bands of cloth are then sewn edge to edge to form a full textile. Marka weavers are famous for weaving blue and white silk cloth in which the pure white fibers of the inner silk cocoon are used for the white stripes and the coarse outer fibers of the outer cocoon are dyed blue and used to form the blue stripes. In large West African cities such as Mopti, Bamako, Bobo Jalasso, and Ouagadougou, dozens of weavers may work together in a workshop where they are paid a wage by a merchant who then markets their weaving. While the man on the right weaves narrow bands of cloth colored in blocks, the man on the left displays a whole cloth that has been assembled from strips sewn together edge to edge so that the colored blocks form geometric patterns. Six hundred miles south of Burkina Faso, in the far southeastern corner of Ghana, Eve weavers in the town of Agbozume produce colorful kente cloth using machine spun and dyed thread. Although there is ample historical evidence that weaving technology came to southern Ghana from peoples to the north, the Eve and Asante weavers of southern Ghana have become the recognized masters of this complex and beautiful art form. Weavers are able to buy colored threads, parts of their looms, and natural dye materials in the Agbozume. Wilson, Jomo Dengue. And where, where does he work? I'm working at Agosme here. Yeah. And how long have you been weaving? I've been weaving about 25 years. 25 years? Yeah. Did you learn from your father? Yes, I learned from my father. How long did it take you to pick, pick, make a piece of cloth like that? At this moment, it will take me about 25 days before I'll finish. About how long? 25 days before yeah, okay. I'll finish. Right. This artist, Wilson Jomotenge, is an Eve weaver from whom I purchased a kente cloth in the summer of 2002 for about 500,000 CDs, or about $60. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the Eve and Asante area, young men and boys are apprenticed to master artists who train them as weavers and sell their work. In exchange, the masters house and feed them for several years until they are able to work independently. It is very common for young Asante men to travel to the Eve workshops to be apprenticed to Eve masters. The parts of the loom and the techniques used to weave are complex. The textile is made up of interwoven warp and weft threads. The warp threads are the black and white striped threads that stretch away from the weaver. The weft thread is wound on a bobbin in a shuttle that is passed back and forth in the weaver's hands. The opening in the warp through which the wefts are passed is called the shed and is opened using the heddles, the mass of strings in the upper right that go up and down, moved by the weaver's feet. The comb or beater is the wooden part which swings back and forth, pushing the weft threads into a tight and uniform weave.
As the warps are wound, the heavy weight to which they are attached drags along the ground. Although the work usually progresses quite rapidly, a broken warp thread forces the weaver to stop, splice in a short piece of white thread, pass it through the heddles and comb, and reattach it to the broken end close to the work bar. He then continues to weave. The cloth being woven here is among the most complex these artists produce. It is a double weave with three sets of warps, one above, one in the middle, and one below. The young man passes the shuttle alternately above and below the middle warps to produce a fabric with different patterns on each side of the cloth. Because he is just learning the difficult technique, his master has instructed him to weave a simple checkerboard pattern. It'll be too wide. It'll be too wide. Your hand, if you want to throw these things on time, yeah. you want to hold this thing, your hand will be hooking it. That is why I will put it in the center. Okay, so yeah. you're just leaving a space yes. in the center so yes. that it doesn't make so much thread. Yes. Okay, all right. Here you can see the warp threads stretched towards us from the loom and the weaver's feet moving up and down to move the heddles to open alternating sheds in the warp through which the shuttle is passed. This young apprentice is winding threads on a bobbin to be placed in a shuttle. The most famous weaving center in the Asante area is the village of Bonwiri, just outside Kumasi, in which dozens of weavers work together in a cooperative and sell their textiles in shops in the center of town. Here the weaver is repairing a broken warp thread. An experienced weaver, weaving a relatively simple warp stripe pattern, can weave at a very fast pace and can complete a couple of feet of cloth in an hour. The warp is quite narrow, and so the strip of cloth is also narrow. This permits the loom to be set up or moved quickly. Several narrow strips are then sewn together edge to edge to form a full piece of cloth. Both Eve and Asante weavers are famous for the complex and colorful patterns they produce using the weft threads to create tapestry or weft float patterns. Here the weaver uses two pairs of heddles as well as a shed stick to open up the shed and pass colored yarns back and forth to form geometric patterns. The yellow, green, and red threads are the warps. The shed stick holds open bundles of several warps at a time to form a weft face fabric in which the weft threads dominate the pattern and are clearly seen on the surface of the textile.
In this black and white kente, long black and white warp threads form a warp stripe pattern that stretches away from the weaver's lap. This is intersected at right angles by the short black and white stripes of the weft face pattern in which there are many more weft threads than warp threads per square inch and so only the weft pattern is visible. The weaver is using black weft floats alternating with white continuous wefts to produce the geometric patterns that zigzag across the cloth. These young Eve and Asante weavers from Ghana and Togo are working in a workshop in Kipetwe on the road between Agbozume and Ho, parallel to the border with Togo. Like almost all such workshops, this is close to the road so that people driving by will stop and watch and purchase cloth. What? This one's from Togo. Unlike the Asante weavers in Bonwiri, who use short strands of loose colored weft threads, these Eve weavers use colored weft threads on numerous small shuttles. It is amazing to see the dexterity with which they can switch shuttles, manipulate the warps, and use the comb or beater. The weaver of this beautiful brown and gold kente is using a second pair of heddles and a shed stick, as at Bonwiri, to weave a weft face fabric in which several warp threads are bundled together as they pass through the second pair of heddles. As he weaves, watch the thick bundles of warp threads in the weft face pattern alternate with the finer, more even brown warp threads in the warp face pattern. One of the most famous examples of women's weaving in West Africa can be found in the Nigerian city of Akwete in southeastern Nigeria. Women have been weaving beautiful colored cloth in Akwete for centuries using women's broad vertical looms. In contrast to men's looms in West Africa, which are narrow and horizontal, women's looms are almost always vertical and much broader. The warps are wrapped around two bars, one above the other, in a continuous line across the width of the loom. See the one she's talking, touch it again. This one is, they call it ahia in the vernacular. It, it may not have an English 
equivalent, but we just know it's Ahia, a part of the instrumentation for this great tradition, Ahia, okay? Okay, w w what about that one? What? Shuttle, Abba. Abba is, is shuttle. She has dropped it. Is it the shuttle that has the thread yes. in it? The shuttle has the thread in it. What are you doing that one? The what? The paddle. Paddle. OTT. OTT. Which one? The one you're putting now is OTT. The weft threads are wrapped on a thin shuttle which the weaver can slide across the loom with a flick of her index finger. There are two narrow protruding fingers at each end of the shuttle which hold the weft threads in place so that they don't become tangled or dislodged as the shuttle is passed across the loom. Girls learn to weave in Akwete when they are very young. Young girls weave on narrow looms that are only about 15 to 30 inches wide, while a woman's full-sized loom may be 40 to 50 inches wide. The women are able to weave quite rapidly. A woman can weave a full-sized piece about 45 by 65 inches in as little as two weeks. During the dry season, a woman may weave for about six hours a day, but during the rainy season, she may weave for as long as nine hours a day. A single heddle is used to form the shed, which permits the weaver to open a space between alternating warp threads through which she can pass the shuttle that carries the weft threads. To open the space through which the shuttle can be passed carrying the weft, the weaver pulls on cotton threads of the heddle and at the same time inserts the paddle or beater in the open space between the warp threads. She then twists the paddle or beater to open the space wider so that she can pass the shuttle from one side of the loom to the other carrying the weft threads. After she has passed the wefts from one side to the other, she beats them in place with a paddle or beater so that the weave will be tight and dense. For the next passage of the wefts across the loom, rather than pulling on the cotton threads, she twists a flat broad stick on edge and this opens the warp threads to form a second shed space. She then inserts the paddle or beater again and pounds the new weft thread into place.
Preparing the warps is particularly complicated on a broad loom, simply because there are so many more warp threads than there are on a, on a men's horizontal narrow loom. The weaver must form a figure eight with the warp threads as she arranges the threads on the loom so that she can form the open shed through which she passes the shuttle as she weaves. Although in the past, Akwete women wove using cotton or silk, today they mostly use rayon, lurex, polyester, and other synthetic fibers, which they can purchase in large quantities and in a broad range of colors in the major cities of Anicha and Abba. When the loom is prepared, the weaver may wrap warp threads of alternating colors, creating contrasting warp stripes. These warp stripes may intersect with weft stripes to create plaids, or they may be incorporated into the distinctive geometric patterns for which the weavers of Akwete are so famous. The women who weave in the city of Akwete are members of the Igbo people who live along the Imo River and who sell their work to many other peoples in southern Nigeria, including the Igbo, the Ija, the Ibani, and the Abibio. Specifically, the people of Akwete belong to the Ndoki clan, which migrated into the region from the western Niger River Delta prior to the 15th century. The city of Akwete has been an important center for trade for centuries, beginning first with the slave trade, and when the slave trade was forbidden, moving to the trade in palm oil, exchanging goods up and down the Imo River with people to the north and south. Traders who came to Akwete to purchase palm oil also purchased women's weaving and then sold it in other parts of southern Nigeria. Fifty years, and according to her, she grew up into this, and since then she's been doing it. Here you can see a senior woman in a quete preparing the string heddles. She wraps a cotton thread around every second warp thread so that when she pulls on the heddle it will form a space or shed between alternating threads. The large frame, or the entire loom, is called ukwe. To produce the complex patterns, extra pattern sticks may be arranged on the upper portion of the loom. These are broad flat sticks that, when twisted on the side, open a new shed through which the weft threads can be passed. These pattern sticks are carefully run through bundles of warps in such a way that when twisted to the side, they open up just the right warps to form a new pattern. In addition, in the past few decades, weavers have begun to attach extra string heddles, which help them open up the weft patterns. Lisa Aronson reports that in Akwete, all women are expected to weave, and that an Akwete woman can produce from two to four cloths in a single month. She estimates that with as many as 500 women working at the same time, an enormous amount of cloth is produced in a short period of time. These beautiful, expensive, and elaborate textiles were used in a variety of different social contexts. One important context was girls coming of age. At about the time of puberty, girls enter what was called the fattening room, where they eat plenty of good food, including yams and cassava. After as much as a year in the fattening room, they are brought out in public in a celebration called the tying of cloth, in which a coite cloth is arranged in the style that is traditional for adult women. During this coming-of-age celebration, a coite cloth is combined with cloth from other parts of Africa, and even from India, in alternating arrangements. Another very important occasion in which a coite cloth is widely used is in funerals in which expensive cloth is arranged on the funeral bed, including several dozen a coite cloths. After the cloths have been arranged on the funeral bed, the corpse of the deceased is carefully arranged on top of the cloth. 
For decades, Akwete weaving has been famous for the geometric patterns, which are given individual names, such as protection in war and peace, pregnant woman, checkerboard, snake, tortoise, flower, saw, or knees of the beauty. Among the most famous are the tortoise and the checkerboard motifs. In the 19th century, Akwete cloth was associated with royalty in the Niger River Delta, and this particular type of cloth called ikaki, with motifs that represent the tortoise, a symbol of wisdom and of cunning, were worn by important leaders throughout the Delta. The ikaki motif was once worn only by high-ranking people or royals, and a commoner caught wearing it could be severely punished. Akwete textiles are primarily used as wrappers by women. They are used in pairs so that the upper wrapper and the lower wrapper match in pattern and color. The upper wrapper overlaps the lower wrapper a few inches higher on the body, and the two wrappers are worn with a thinner, finer, tailored blouse. The production and trade in textiles is closely linked to the history of Africa. In the 16th century, Portuguese slave traders captured weavers on the coast of West Africa and shipped them to the Cape Verde Islands in the Atlantic Ocean west of Dakar. They forced these slaves to weave very complex and beautiful textiles which they called panyosh. The slave traders then used the textiles to purchase more slaves on the West African coast. Male weavers in Cape Verde continue to make these very beautiful strip woven cloths that are characterized by very regular but intricate weft patterns. The textiles are used exclusively by women in Cape Verde, and very few of them show up in the markets in other parts of Africa, nor do they weaving. appear so frequently is not the only on the international does. art market. Does, is he, does he do farming too, or does he do other kinds of labor? Does anybody, thing, so. yeah. mm -hmm. Does anybody in, in Praia or Cabo Verde export these textiles to the United States or France or, or Portugal? Just the, 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 the yeah. that lives out uh, abroad. That live abroad. Eric Sanchez works at a very typical West African narrowband horizontal men's loom. There is one pair of main heddles, a beater bar, a shuttle, a work bar, and the warp threads which stretch out for some distance to a weight which drags along the ground. What is unusual about this loom is the large number of additional string heddles, which Mr. Sanchez can manipulate by hand, opening up a shed space into which he inserts a shed stick. He twists the shed stick up on edge to open the space for the shuttle. As he then continues to weave, the shed stick slaps down to a horizontal position. The supplemental string heddles are arranged in such a way that their use produces a very regular but complex pattern of weft threads. Because of the use of these supplemental heddles, Mr. Sanchez can weave complex patterns very rapidly. Eric. 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 Eric, the name of family, is it? Eric Sanchez Ribeiro. Okay, thank you. are more complex. Mm -hmm. Does he weave just uh, because he wants to or does he only weave if somebody orders uh, 
if somebody orders a, a piece of cloth. Yes. What? Il fait les tissages seulement si quelqu'un va, va le commander. Non, il le fait toujours. Il, est... il dit qu'il y a des gens qui ont This man is named Eric Sanchez and he is a weaver in the city of Santa Catarina. I visited and interviewed him in 2004 with the staff of the National Museum from the city of Praia. Mr. Sanchez is clearly a skilled weaver, but he cannot make a living just doing weaving. He must also work in his fields as a farmer to make enough income to support his family. Et je lui ai demandé s'il n'y a pas d'autre endroit comme Lisbonne, Portugal. Il me dit que les fils qui s'adaptent à son style de travail, il ne les trouve pas d'accord. Ceux qui viennent d'ailleurs de Portugal ou d'Europe. Mr. Sanchez points out that each of the patterns has its own distinctive, distinctive name, which the weavers use to refer to specific designs. The large diamond shaped pattern at the center of the weft is called caballo, or the horse. Est-ce qu'il y a des... Vous avez dit qu'il y a une dame qui a demandé ce style-là. Est-ce qu'il y a des noms... Euh... These two video clips, one of women weaving in the Igbo village of Akwete in Nigeria, followed by the male weaver in the Cape Verde Islands, are intended to demonstrate the fundamental differences between the looms and techniques that are used by men and women in West Africa. Women weave on broad looms that are arranged vertically between two bars, separated by vertical posts. They use one string heddle and a broad beater bar. The length of the warp is simply double the distance between the two horizontal bars. It is short and broad. Some women may weave two broad claws that are then sewn edge to edge, selvage to selvage, to form a larger textile. The only weavers who use this type of loom in West Africa are women. But in Central Africa, the same type of loom is used by men to weave raffia cloth. In contrast, men in West Africa weave on narrow horizontal warp looms that have double heddles. The warps are extremely long, and when the weaver has used up all of the warp threads, he cuts the long strip into shorter pieces, which are then sewn edge to edge to form a full piece of cloth. Rather than using a beater bar, he uses a comb, or beater that swings back and forth to force the weft threads into a tight weave. Men and women may use additional string heddles to assist in weaving patterns. On women's broad looms, these are individual string heddles that are arranged on the upper portion of the loom. On men's narrow looms, these are narrow string heddles that are suspended from a bar above the warp threads. They can be manipulated using pedals, which the weaver moves with his feet, or the weaver can manipulate them with his hands. <laughs>